Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining. My name is Alexis. I use your pronouns and I'm the coordinator for the Tryon Creek Watershed Council. I'm really excited to introduce today um, Laura Guderian. So Laura has worked as an ecologist uh, for 15 years, first for the city of Gresham and now for Portland Parks and Recreation. She actively works to restore natural areas throughout the Willamette River and Columbia Slough watersheds, making them as healthy as possible for the wildlife that live here and the people that visit. So Laura gets to work closely with volunteer groups of all ages, helping them to steward our lands and learn about the plants and animals that live in our city. She recently started working towards her PhD and you can often find her um, with her binoculars, searching for two native turtle species. And in her downtime, Laura climbs, mountaineers and racks up as many miles backpacking with her husband and their dog wizard as possible. Their tortoise, little dude, and a couple other tortoises I just learned about uh, prefer to stay home from those adventures. And then, Laura, if you want to toggle on to the next slide, does that sound right to you? And I'll introduce the Watership Council. Awesome. So thank you all for joining us. This science talk here is hosted uh, by us at Tryon Creek Watership Council. This map shows where the Tryon Creek watershed lies within the Portland metro area. And so we focus on a lot of different things. We work towards restoration and stewardship of the Tryon Creek watershed, um, both with you know, grant funded projects on small properties, as well as volunteer events with the community at large who we engage with at things like this science talk and also our Watershed 101 workshop program, where we're able to provide education as well as plant resources and um, provide some on the ground guidance to watershed residents. We also do some partnership coordination work, hosting quarterly stewardship committee meetings with other restoration practitioners. And all of this work is really, really fun. And this science talk today is with thanks to the Bureau of Environmental Services Community Watershed Stewardship Program. So if you'd like to learn more about the Tryon Creek Watershed and the Watershed Council, um, this map that you're seeing is from our interactive web map where there's a bunch of layers you can toggle on and off and look at different points of interest throughout the watershed. Um, without anything else to add, Laura, back over to you. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna actually stop sharing because that way you all will get to see the fun critters and friends that I brought. So um, yeah, do whatever you need to do to make your screen, you know, so that I'm the biggest, so that you can see as, as close as possible. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. It's my honor to be here today. Um, I worked with Alexis when she was with the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. So it's exciting to hop across the river and do a little bit of West Side work as well. Um, so most of you know me um, for the work that I did with City of Gresham for 10 years. And now that I do for City of Portland, um, but I also, um, in my spare time, I'm getting my PhD at PSU, and so I am here today representing um, PSU um, and the research that I'm um, conducting kind of throughout Northwest Oregon on native turtles. So um, I'm just getting over a cold, so I'm going to try and not be gross and blow my nose, but I do have tea and, and that sort of thing, so hopefully that doesn't um, gross anybody out. But we have to start off with a poll question, um, Alexis. The first poll question is how many species of native turtles do we have in Oregon? And if you were listening to the bio, you probably got the answer already, but I'm curious just to see where folks are at here. So how many kinds of turtles do you think that we have? Native turtles, I guess I should say. Native kinds of turtles. We've had some close listeners in the bio, but we also have had some people join since. So there's a variety okay. of guessers here. <laughs> Good, perfect. All, All right. right. We've had about three quarters of the people polled. Do you want to go ahead and end it or should we give folks another little chance? That's good. So okay. yeah, awesome job. Um, so the, the correct answer is two. So half of you are right on target. There is a reason though that you might think that we have three or four. Um, and I'm actually gonna introduce you to at least four species. There's a, a bonus fifth species that I might introduce you to if we have time at the end. Um, but to start off with, I want to just show you the turtles that we have here in Oregon. So again, we have two native species. Um, both of them are aquatic. Um, Oh, and you know what? Actually, I lied because we didn't specify freshwater species. So those of you that said four or more and were thinking about marine species, you're very, you're actually very correct. We have two species of freshwater. Um, 
uh, turtles. And then we also have several species of marine uh, turtles as well. But here in the valley, we've only got our two native freshwater species. Um, one is called the native uh, Western painted turtle and one is the Northwestern pond turtle. Um, both of them are um, kind of in trouble a little bit. So they're listed by the state as um, sensitive species, um, specifically as critical. Um, and that just means that their populations and their habitats are decreasing pretty steadily over time. And so we're concerned about them. And so we're trying to figure out um, a little bit more about their habitat needs and their population extent so that we can better preserve them on the landscape. And that's really kind of the heart of the PhD project that I'm working on. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But without further ado, so the more common of the two native species that we have is the Western painted turtle. Um, and so I've got two Western painted turtles here to show you. Let me just try them off because I want to show you the difference between the male and the female. So this is a Western painted turtle. So the back of the shell is kind of nondescript, like not super exciting, kind of green, a little bit of modeling. It's really the belly shell that's kind of that bright orange and black pattern that's really unique and special. And that pattern is actually um, a fingerprint. So it's unique to each individual animal. And I'll show you the other one and you can see the difference between them. Ooh, hold on, I'm sharing somehow. There we go. Um, so this is our Western painted turtle. You can see they have that yellow striping on their um, on their neck. So on the side of the neck, they have yellow striping like somebody painted them with a paintbrush. And then that bright orange belly. And then here's the other one. So you can see how different the belly patterns are. So again, those patterns are something that we can use to uniquely identify these turtles. We can take a picture when we capture a native turtle and then they'll have that same pattern on their belly um, shell, the plastron, their entire life. So that can be really um, unique. So um, while I've got both of them here, you can see, I want you to look at the tails. So can you guys see how one of the tails is a lot shorter and narrower than the other one? So that tells us that this turtle here is a female. The male has a much longer and thicker tail because they have what are called hemipenes. So they actually have two penises that are inside the tail. And so it makes the base of the tail longer and thicker. So that's one way that you can tell males from females if you were to get them kind of um, in hand. Um, and then the other is the, the front claws. So the, the front claws of the male are longer than the female. And I don't know if they're gonna participate and be able to do this. Let's see, I don't know. So the male actually has much longer claws. So this is the male. Um, and that's because when they're mating, the male sits on top of the female and he needs to be able to kind of clasp onto her and grab onto her. So his nails are much longer than the females. This is the female. So that tail and then the size of the claws can be two things that you can look for to tell males from females. Another thing is the um, kind of adult size. So when you think about the males and the females, the females actually have to be able to be big enough that they can fit their eggs inside their shell, right? So turtles, um, some folks, um, I uh, don't realize, but that shell is actually completely connected to their body. So they can never just like walk away from their shell. They're completely attached. So all of their soft tissue, all of their skin is attached to their shell. And so inside on the back of the shell is actually where their vertebrae are. Their, their um, skeleton is actually integrated into the shell itself and attached. So for the female to be able to have eggs, she needs to be kind of fatter or thicker. Um, to be able to fit those eggs inside, um, inside her abdomen. So the males tend to be a little bit flatter and more pancake. And then the, the females tend to be a little bit more like, I, I like to say kind of an old uh, Civil War Army helmet. They tend to be a little bit more mounded and that's just to allow space for those eggs. And they can have up to 12 or even 15 eggs inside their shell um, uh, at one time. So they need to have plenty of space for that. So this is our Western painted turtle. So our Western painted turtles are fairly common. Um, they're the one that you will see um, kind of around Portland. Um, this is 
really kind of the southernmost extent of their range. So they actually have a really cool range that goes all the way across the United States, um, really kind of from east coast to west coast, um, the painted turtle. But then the western species is um, kind of Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. And we have kind of the, the last little nugget, the last little line of Western painted turtles that kind of dip down into the Portland, Vancouver area. So this is um, a species that you have a little bit more commonly north, um, all the way through Idaho, Montana, um, and into the breadbasket states. So it has an actually a pretty, pretty large um, range, though here in Oregon, it's really just in the Portland metro area. So if you were to go to Smith Bybee, Whitaker Ponds, um, Salvi Island, this is the one that you're most likely gonna be seeing up there. And you can identify it when it's up on a log because you can see it has that bright orange belly. So if it's sitting this way or sitting this way, you can usually see somehow that line of kind of a bright orangey red color. And that can tell you that this is the, the Western painted turtle. So that's that one. And then our other native species is called the Northwestern Pond Turtle. And this one is a little bit even more special, I would say, because you don't really have them in Portland anymore. Um, there's, uh, these guys used to be more common throughout the valley and up into Puget Sound area. But with habitat issues um, and development, we were starting to get quite a few less of them. So they're actually a lot more common south of us, up through about um, kind of the Eugene, Albany into Salem area. Once you get up here into the northern part of the valley, they're actually pretty rare. Um, there are only a few spots on the west side that um, I've found them during my surveys. Historically, there probably were quite a few more of them and we have some historical records um, identifying them throughout the SLU, for example, and up into Washington. And there's also been some populations that have been head started um, up in Washington. So the various zoos and aquariums on the West Coast have gotten together to help head start or raise young hatchlings and release them um, onto uh, different sites in Washington to try to reestablish those populations. So they do not have that bright orange belly. They also have kind of a, a nondescript. They tend to blend in a, a lot more. And then same thing with the, the carapace or the back shell is also um, fairly kind of dark mottled greenish brown. This one is a male. You can tell, see that tail, how big that tail is. And you can also tell because he has a white chin. You can see that. So the male pond turtle tends to have a white chin, whereas the female, it's much, much more um, uh, kind of like a, a yellowy color, a yellowy light brown color. So this is our pond turtle. And same thing goes in terms of males versus females. We talked about the tail a little bit, but same thing in terms of the claws, the male's claws will be a lot longer and then their body will be a little bit flatter, more like a pancake. So both of our native turtles um, live in aquatic habitats. We talked about that, right? So they're living in ponds and wetlands for the most part, slow moving or still water habitats. The pond turtle actually can live pretty well in um, stream habitats as well, especially if there are um, some nice backwater or floodplain areas that they can kind of back off into and get out of the, the heavy flows when we have our, our heavy um, spring winter rains. So the pond turtle can be seen in a little bit more of a variety of habitats, but the painted turtle really likes to have those slow or still moving waters. And generally we tend to see them up on logs when we do see them. And that's because they are what's called exothermic or cold blooded. And that doesn't mean that their blood is literally cold. It just means that they don't have a metabolism like humans do and other mammals. So we eat food and then when we burn that food through our metabolism, we create the heat that our body needs to stay a constant temperature and they don't do that. So they need to actually go sit in the sun for six to eight hours a day in order to um, do the normal processes that we do. So things like um, incubating eggs, fighting disease, um, having just the energy to move around and mate um, or disperse into different habitats. Um, as well as digest food. So 
them being able to get up into the sunshine and heat themselves up um, with direct sunlight is really important. And that's one of the, the issues that we're finding is that a lot of ponds that we have, especially on the west side of Portland um, and uh, kind of into the West Hills, a lot of the ponds that we have are um, kind of plain. They don't have a lot of tree branches. They don't have a lot of what we call refugia or different places for turtles to bask. And so it's hard for them to get up out of the water and get that sunshine that they need. So that's actually one of the things that I'm looking at to see if that's what's lacking. And that might be what's causing um, a decrease in some of these uh, native turtles across the region. So that's our, and then some folks are curious how, how big they get to be. And I've got kind of an empty shell that's an adult. So I can hold it back. So this one, um, the live one is about three or four years old. And then the adult gets to be about two, maybe three times that big. So you can kind of see how big it will get eventually. And then all of our turtles um, reproduce with eggs. So um, when you think about reptiles, reptiles typically have either live birth, like a lot of our garter snake species, or they'll lay eggs. And those eggs are kind of special in that they're not hard shelled like a bird egg. They're actually very leathery and soft. And so um, the female in the summer months in July will come up um, onto land, um, usually fairly close to the water, but she'll want to, her eggs and her nest to be um, above the water level. So if it's a pond or a stream that floods a lot, she'll probably go a little bit further away from the stream because we don't want the, she doesn't want the nest to flood, but she will go and dig a hole with her back legs. So she'll quite literally, sit, she'll sit down kind of in a spot that she likes She'll urinate to soften the ground and then she'll use her back feet, just kind of like this one's doing here to excavate a hole that's probably exactly as long as their legs. So maybe four to six inches deep. And it's kind of looks almost like a little pear, like a little vase. And then she'll lay each egg into her foot and, and set it down into the nest chamber. And she'll kind of arrange the eggs in the nest chamber. And then she'll bring her legs up and she'll start scooping the dirt and the rocks and the leaves and the grass back over it to camouflage it and cover it up. So what you end up with is kind of this, um, this uh, pear-shaped, flask-shaped nest with a, a dirt plug that's kind of stopping it up. And those babies will hang out um, and grow in those eggs and eventually hatch out sometime in September or October. So they're in their egg for two to three months, roughly. And then September, October, they'll hatch out. But here in the Pacific Northwest, most of them actually just hang out in the nest because our winters um, still get a little bit too cold. It's not advantageous for them to come out of the nest and go to the water and try to survive their first winter in the water. So a lot of them actually will stay in the nest and um, all of the, the hatchlings will kind of arrange themselves in the nest with their heads up and they'll kind of be all packed in like little sardines in that little flask of a nest. And they'll just hang out there and await uh, spring rains. And when the spring rains come like today, um, the, that nest plug, that dirt plug that the female closed the nest up with will start to kind of melt and get soft. And then the, the babies can kind of crawl their way out. They can dig their way out of the, of the nest and come out onto the surface of the soil. And then they can orient themselves and find where the water is and they'll head to the water. And they'll spend the first couple of years of their life right near the water's edge within about three feet of the water's edge where it's nice and shallow and warm. And there's lots of insects for them to feed on because their whole goal is to get nice and big so that they can't fit into a predator's mouth. So the, the goal of the hatchling is really just to, to eat and get as big as possible, as fast as possible. So that's how, they, that's how they reproduce. So those are our, our two native species. So I'm gonna show you a couple of non-native species that we have as well. So the non-native species are ones that um, for the most part are here because um, they're very common pet turtles. Um, and Unfortunately, folks don't realize how long turtles live. So our natives can live anywhere from 30 to 70 years. And the non-native, the two non-native species that I show you are very similar. They can live 30 years or so. And so when 
somebody gets a turtle as a pet when they're, you know, kind of a, a younger child or a teenager, they don't realize that it's really quite a commitment to hold on to and take care of that animal for as long as they need to for its life. And so um, what tends to end up happening is that folks kind of get tired of the animal or they don't want it anymore. And they don't want to um, kill it or give it to somebody else. And so they tend to take it down to the, the local pond and, and release it. And so this is one of those species. This is called the red-eared slider. I don't know if you can see, he's got that red line kind of right behind the eye. So that red line is why they call it the red-eared slider. And it also has those yellow stripes like our native does, but the bottom shell, the plastron is not nearly as gorgeous. It's kind of a mustard yellow with these big black splotches on it. So again, if you're looking at a pond and you see turtles, um, that are basking, look to see if do you see kind of a mustard yellow color kind of right under their chin, or do you see that kind of bright orangey red? If it's the mustard yellow, it's probably the non-native red-eared slider. Sometimes it's easy to see that red ear. Sometimes it's harder to see it in the sunlight, but look for that, that bottom shell color. That's really gonna be your best bet for telling the difference between the two species. And so the red-eared slider is a very common pet turtle. Um, they're illegal to have here in Oregon. You can't um, have them as pets. You can't um, buy them, sell them, trade them, give them away, et cetera. But you can, of course, go over to Vancouver, Washington to a, a pet store and pick one up and bring it back into Oregon. Um, and so that tends to be what a lot of, um, a lot of folks end up doing. So yes, if you live in Oregon, you're not supposed to have this turtle because they cause so much damage to the wetland and to our native species. They have an almost um, complete overlap in terms of habitat needs. Um, so everything from um, having needing to bask to requiring the same nesting habitat, the same food. Um, and so they tend to get a little bit, they tend to get quite a bit bigger than our natives do and they tend to be a little bit more aggressive. And so they'll actually push our natives off of logs. This is, he's pushing off of logs. Um, and then they'll just outcompete them for food and other habitat spaces. So um, a lot of times when you have red-eared sliders in a wetland, you might still have some natives, but in general, the, the red-eared sliders are kind of taking over. And I have um, an adult shell to show you. So, if you remember the native um, adult got to be about this big. So this is what the red-eared slider adult gets to be this big. So considerably larger, right? So the red-eared slider gets to be a lot bigger. They have a lot more eggs in their clutch when they go to, when they go to um, uh, reproduce. And then they very directly compete and outcompete with our native species. So this is a species that's native to the southeastern U.S. Um, so it is a native species down um, from, you know, kind of Mississippi River and down into the Delta area, um, Carolinas and um, Florida, that sort of thing. And it's a pretty hardy species um, here in the Pacific Northwest because it does so well with our kind of mild winters. So this is definitely one that if you have one as a pet in Oregon, um, you can reach out to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and get a permit to keep it. Um, and then really the main thing is that if you have one and you don't want it anymore to be, do the responsible thing and to turn it over, um, you can always turn it over to me. I'm happy to take them um, and turn them over to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, but please, please, please do not release your pets into the wetlands. So the other non-native species that I have, the one that makes people kind of ooh and ah a little bit is the snapping turtle. So I've got a little snapping turtle. Well, he's not super little, but this is another common pet turtle. So this is our snapping turtle. And these are turtles that are also valued for, um, for their pets. They're just kind of weird and unique and they're kind of, you know, dinosaur-like. And so people like to have them as a pet. But again, they don't realize that they get to be very, very large and they live to be several decades. And so what is kind of cute in an aquarium when it's two or three years old is not so cute when it's in your bathtub. 
um, and quickly outgrowing your house. Um, so this is a, a shell of a snapping turtle. And this one is very small still. So this is still like a juvenile shell. They can be twice that big. Um, I personally have pulled out um, a couple of 20 plus pound snapping turtles from various ponds in and around Portland and Gresham. So um, they can be very large. They're also prized for their food, to be food as their, for their meat. And so some people also um, in the past have raised them um, for the protein value, um, but they're not super popular. And so again, they tend to get left or escape um, into our local ponds. The snapping turtle is kind of unique in the sense that with our native turtles and with the red-eared slider, they all kind of swim through the water to feed. So they have to be underwater to swallow and they swim through the water and they look for insects, worms, bugs, uh, small fish, anything that they can kind of go after and hunt and grab. The snapping turtle though is really cool because it's what we call a sit and wait predator. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to show you how long its neck is. So it'll stretch its neck out. Um, and you'll see that this turtle will sit on the bottom of the pond and it has a little tongue that's pink that looks like a little lure that it'll kind of wave back and forth in the water. And when fish or other insects come to take a bite of that lure, it will eat them. So it has this long neck, come on buddy. It has this long neck that will, um, there it is. Very long neck that it can use to reach out and grab whenever anything comes nearby. So it has a little bit of a different lifestyle. So the danger of this one um, is that it really changes the habitat of a wetland. So it tends to eat a lot of the prey that's available that would be um, and, and be kind of direct competition for our natives. But then it also um, just tends to, uh, to go after a lot more live prey too. So a lot of times they'll go after ducklings, they'll go after fish, they'll go after bats, they'll go after kind of just about anything that will kind of land in the water or that they can get to. And so they can really kind of decimate the wildlife um, in a pond um, if they're not native to it. And the other cool thing is their, their bottom shell is actually really small. You can see they're actually really kind of soft and squishy. Um, their bottom shell is really small. And so, you know, when you think about kind of how dinosaur-like and spiky they are on the back, that's really just to protect that very soft and squishy belly that doesn't have too much protection. So that plastron is really small. So it's important for them to be kind of fierce so that they can protect themselves because if a predator were to get them on their back, um, they'd be pretty susceptible to that predator. So that's our, our snapping turtle. So same thing, um, tend to be either a pet or just kind of a, a fun animal that people think will be kind of kooky and weird and interesting to have, um, but don't realize that they can be 30 or 40 pounds when they're full grown. Um, and, and very large, um, and then also very fierce. So this one right now, um, as a snapping turtle, probably wouldn't really break the skin if it were to snap on my finger, not gonna try it, um, but the adults could definitely um, break a bone. So um, you definitely wanna be careful if you see a, a full grown or an adult snapping turtle out in the wilds. And we do have these um, kind of around Portland, more on the west side, really, Hillsborough and Beaverton area. Um, there are some ponds where they're actively reproducing. I've caught a couple of um, isolated individuals on the east side of Portland, but really um, they're more common on the west side. They've just gotten established there for whatever reason. So those are our four aquatic species. And I wanted to tell you guys a little bit more about kind of how this pertains to Tryon Creek specifically. Um, and a little bit about some of the habitat. So I'm gonna share my screen so that I can show you a couple more slides. So let's see, here's a slide. Oop. Oop. There we go. So this is showing um, where turtles spend their time. Because again, a lot of folks think about turtles as being very aquatic, very water loving, and they are, but they actually use the upland terrestrial habitat quite a bit as well. 
And so it's really important to protect both the aquatic and the terrestrial habitat around the ponds. And that's actually where we're starting to have um, issues with fragmentation. Um, we'll build a road next to a pond or a trail and it kind of divides up that habitat that they need and they can't get back and forth. There are too many barriers. So while they do spend a lot of their time in the pond, they also come up on land to nest. We talked about the females coming up to dig holes and lay their eggs. They also come up on land when it's too hot or too cold. So um, there's a process that turtles go through called estivation. And that's when it's too hot out and the water is actually too warm. They'll actually come out of the water and find a dense thicket or forest and they'll dig down into um, the kind of top layers of the soil and the leaves and the duff and the needles and they'll hang out in there um, where it's a little bit cooler and they'll spend the hot days of summer there so that's called estivation the other time for especially um, the pond turtle is um, what's called brumation and that's basically overwintering it's kind of a turtle version of hibernation so it's called brumation with a B. Um, and same thing, they're trying to escape the frost line. So they'll come out of the pond and they'll hunker down in the leaf litter of a forest or a dense thicket of some kind to try to um, escape the, the dense freezing cold of winter. And then when it starts to get warm again, they'll head back to the, to the water. So the pond turtles will definitely come up into the uplands to do that for winter. Our native pond, or sorry, our native painted turtles will actually stay in the pond. So if you can see down here um, on the slide, number three is kind of showing you where the bottom of the pond is, where the overwintering might happen for the painted turtles. So a lot of them will just dig down into the dirt and the mud at the bottom of the pond, and they can actually slow their, um, their breathing very, very much so that they don't really have to breathe a whole lot. And I think this brings us to our second poll question, Alexis, if you wanna pop that up. So which of these is true, do you all think? In the winter, Oregon's native turtles, do they hike south? Do they just start marching south for the winter? Um, do they breathe underwater using special skin? Um, do they eat dragonfly popcorn and veg on Netflix? Um, or do they maybe slow everything down by just eating vegetation? So those are our options. Give it another minute. It's rolling in. Or your co-host, can you see the results as they're coming in as well? I can, okay, yes. Okay, cool. Cool. We're about two thirds of the way through everyone having answered. Awesome. Yeah, so um, really great answers. Um, I'm glad that folks don't think they hike south for the, for the winter. That would take them a long time and they'd have to go pretty far. Um, while they do enjoy dragonfly uh, larva as prey, um, they don't really have access to Netflix. So the two answers um, that would be best there are that they breathe underwater and have special skin that lets them breathe um, and then slow digestion. So both of those are really true. Um, the one that's a little bit more true is um, breathing underwater because when they're in that brumation state, that overwintering state, they're not really eating anything. So usually what they'll do is kind of clean out their digestive tract so that they don't have food in there that's kind of rotting over the winter months. So they'll kind of poop it all out, get rid of everything out of their intestines um, so that they're kind of empty. And then they'll go into this kind of um, brumation state. Um, and so the, the cool fact there is that they do have um, special skin on their bums. Yes, right around the bum or the cloaca, as we call it with reptiles and amphibians and birds. So um, reptiles and amphibians and birds have one hole that all of their waste comes out of called the cloaca. And right around that cloaca is really special skin um, that is adapted to allow them to actually take up oxygen through there. So in addition to them um, reducing digestion, um, slowing their breathing down to maybe one or two breaths an hour. Um, any oxygen that they do need, they can take from through that special skin around the cloaca. Um, and then if you also here in the Pacific Northwest ever see like in January, we'll get those sudden weeks of warm weather, all of a sudden the turtles will come out again. So they can actually wake up out of that um, overwintering and come and make use of those warm winter days 
and then they can go back down and continue overwintering. Um, so they can also come in and out of that brumation state a lot more than um, when we think of like a polar bear hibernating or um, birds that are going through torpor or that kind of thing. Um, so that's something else that they can do that's, that's kind of special. There we go. So let's talk about Trying Creek Watershed. Um, so the project that I'm working on for my PhD covers kind of seven different counties. So really it's bounded on the north, to the north by the Columbia River, um, south by kind of the Salem uh, uh, developed area, and then the Cascade and the coast ranges um, to the east and west. So it's seven different counties that I'm looking at and um, I'm looking to see where have his turtles historically been found um, and then updating that information so that we know currently where do we actually have turtles right now. So one of the first things that I did was to go and collect any and all known turtle sighting data from any source that I could possibly find. So that was talking with different agencies. Um, cities and counties and watershed councils have done surveys. Um, but then we also have crowdsourcing uh, sources like iNaturalist. Um, and so I was able to put all of those together and we had about 5,500 turtle sightings throughout kind of the, the seven counties that make up the lower and middle Willamette Valley. Um, and this is what we found for, this is what I found for Trine Creek Watershed, uh, for the Trent Creek Watershed. So not a lot of historical sightings in general. Um, and then um, a lot of those sightings are fairly old. So the one that's at Jackson Middle School is really interesting to me because I'm wondering if they actually found it at Jackson Middle School or if somebody brought it into the school. Um, and then that's just kind of where the location tag got placed. Um, also with Maricara Natural Area, that's actually a Portland Park natural area. Um, there's not a lot of ponded water. So same thing, I'm curious if that one um, also came in on its own or if somebody maybe moved it in. Um, and then some of these other ones, um, for example, the, uh, the Foothill George Rogers and Iron Mountain Parks, that's kind of like the whole of the Lake Oswego area. There's lots of turtles in that general area. There's lots of little ponds. The lake itself has quite a few turtles. Um, and so um, that's a, a good kind of hot spot historically to have seen turtles as well. So last summer I went through um, all of the different locations and resurveyed them. And this is what I have found for current distribution. So nothing at the Jackson Middle School, nothing at Maricara. Um, Trying Creek State Park looks a little bit promising in the sense that it has Trying Creek running through it. But the creek is fairly narrow and incised and shady. And so it doesn't have a lot of that basking habitat that turtles need. So I feel like they might be using it to migrate around and move through the watershed, but I don't know that they're spending significant amounts of time there. And then again, that, um, that Lake Oswego area is really kind of the hot spot. So Lake Oswego itself um, has multiple places where there are native and non-native um, turtles hanging out the McVeigh Avenue Dam, for example, and the Lily Bay area. Um, there were several turtles at Lily Bay. I couldn't quite get an identification on them because I had to kind of scramble down a, a slope and kind of trespass a little bit over a railroad track. So yeah, I wasn't able to, to really tell the species, but there are definitely um, quite a few turtles around the Lake Oswego area. Um, and then South Shore Boulevard as well, there's a couple of spots down in there. So there are definitely some turtles in the watershed. Um, unfortunately, Trying Creek just doesn't represent the best turtle habitat in general. Like I said, similar with the uh, Trying Creek State Park, a lot of the habitat is, um, uh, so a lot of the, the natural habitat, a lot of the undeveloped habitat is dense forest. Um, and really turtles need open, sunny basking areas in order to complete their life cycles. So while there is significant park and natural area land within the watershed, a lot of it is almost too, veg too densely vegetated. Um, and so that can be an issue. Um, 
there's also in that upper right photo, um, very similar to the one that Alexis showed at the beginning of um, the presentation, there's quite a bit of developed or impervious pavement as well. So outside of Trying Creek State Park, there's not a lot of spaces really for kind of contiguous open area for turtles to be able to move around and go to upland areas as well as those, those ponded, slow or still moving water areas. And so um, there's, a, there's some things that need to be done in the watershed to make it a little bit more habitable. Um, and there's also a lot of the watershed that just hasn't been surveyed, which is really interesting. So um, if we go back to this slide, you can see that there's really technically only three sites within the watershed that have been identified as possibilities for turtles. And a lot of that is because a lot of the land in the watershed is privately owned. So there very well could be other turtles living elsewhere on privately owned ponds or stream sections that I just don't have access to. So if anybody knows of additional places to look, I would be very curious to, to hear from you. Um, I would like to be able to cover uh, more of the watershed with surveys. Um, but like I said, right now, there just aren't that many um, open water areas to survey that I have access to. So that can be a little bit of, um, of a challenge. And then um, one of the things that we wanted to go through a little bit at the end here is just what you can do to help Oregon turtles. So even though there aren't a lot of turtles in the watershed, in the Trying Creek watershed, if that's where you live, there's still a lot that you can do. Um, teaching your friends and family, you've kind of sat here and listened to me hammer on for about 45 minutes. Um, spread the word, go tell your friends and family about our two native species, what makes them special and unique, um, and how they're both, you know, somewhat declining in our area and are in need of help. Um, even just spreading the word and making it a little bit more common knowledge that we have turtles um, can do a lot to raise the visibility of them um, and their conservation. Secondly, you've got this amazing watershed council that's doing all kinds of really great habitat restoration. So, um, you know, changing out culverts and removing invasive species, planting native species, those are all things that are gonna help improve the, the general ecology and habitat of the watershed and make it more likely to be able to support animals like turtles um, in the watershed. So. Um, any kind of restoration that you can volunteer with helping um, to help to reduce the kind of human, uh, human footprint or human impact on the watershed will go a long way towards making it more habitable for all wildlife, um, even turtles. And then if you find a turtle, I know um, Alexis sent me a couple of questions ahead of time about what to do if you actually find a turtle. So there's actually a really great website that we have, um, OregonTurtles.org, and there's all kinds of great information on there about our native turtles, photos, how to identify them, et cetera. But there's a really great way that you can report turtles that you've seen. So ideally what you could do is take a photo so that we could actually see some of those identifying characteristics. And then you can um, upload that photo and information about where you saw it. And that information goes directly to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, to uh, a woman named Susan Barnes. And she turns around and looks to see where was it found. And then she'll send it to kind of the local agency um, who owns the land that this turtle was seen on. So I get quite a few of these, for example, when folks report them at Whitaker Ponds, Kelly Point Park, um, Oaks Bottom, et cetera. So it's a really great network of people that are all engaged and, and know where these turtles are. Um, so, so please uh, report when you see turtles, that's really helpful. And then we talked a little bit about this already, don't dump your pets. Um, so these are some examples, whether it's vegetation clippings from your yard or it's um, an unwanted pet. Um, the goldfish here um, were released into a stream um, and they grew to be a pretty amazing size. And then uh, the little tortoise here actually is, um, a photo of, of my one of my rescues. This is um, Little Dude. So he's a, a tortoise. So he's uh, not aquatic. He's um, a burrowing animal. He's actually from kind of the Middle East area. And um, people tend to have them as pets in their backyard. And because they're burrowing, they can dig out of your yard pretty easily. And so Little Dude, we actually found walking down the road in March in Gresham. 
um, he'd escaped and we couldn't find his owners. And so I ended up rescuing him. So same thing, if you have a pet, make sure that that pet is your responsibility and you're not releasing it or allowing it to um, kind of escape into um, the natural habitat because they can, they can cause a lot of harm there. And then these are some of the best places to find turtles. Um, so while we're still on the lookout for more turtles in Tryon Creek, um, Smith Bybee is a fantastic area. You can walk the little trail that's um, up on Marine Drive. And there's some really amazing ponds that are um, just full of turtles. And I'm actually gonna be trapping there over the next few weeks. So I'm actually doing some of my research out there to see how many turtles we have and how healthy they are. Um, Whitaker Ponds is also a, a site that I manage for parks. And um, I do trapping out there every year to keep an eye on how um, uh, robust that population is. And then Savi Island as well. Um, there's a lot of public land out there that you can kind of wander trails and look into the di different sloughs and canals. Um, and there are a lot of turtles there as well. So those would be some kind of hot spots if you want to go take a hike um, and see if you can identify some turtles yourselves. And if you look in this picture, you can actually see, and I don't know if my pointer will work. I don't know if you guys can see this turtle here. So this turtle here, this actually looks very mustard yellow and black to me. So this actually probably is a red-eared slider, a non-native slider. This one, you can almost see red on the head of it. So a lot of times what you'll see is a big line of turtles like this on a log and it'll be mixed with natives and non-natives. So this is a great time to grab a pair of binoculars and go check it out and see if you can figure out how many are native and how many are not native. Um, and then kind of watch over time and see if the, the natives start to, to rebound and come back in those areas. And I think that's all I have for today. I know folks need to get back to work, but I'm here if folks have questions, I'm happy to take any additional questions that you might have. Awesome, Laura, thank you so much. That was really, really super cool. I've been multitasking, kind of tracking incoming questions and also learning. So I hope that um, I do a good job conveying these here to you. Um, maybe very first, first question, one of the things you were talking about right at the end here um, was Smith and Bybee and Whitaker Ponds as good places. Would Oaks, um, would Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge or any places along the Willamette be potential turtle sighting areas? They would. So as you get into the Willamette River, kind of down in the Portland area, the river tends to be very incised and tends to be um, uh, a lot, much faster flowing. So I've seen painted turtles using the Willamette River to move around, but they're not gonna like hang out and live in the river itself. They're gonna want those backwater areas. So a couple of years ago, we um, redid the culvert that connects Oaks Bottom to the Willamette Re River. And we're hopeful that in the coming years, more painted turtles will find that culvert and be able to make it into the refuge and establish a population there. Right now, we occasionally see a turtle I don't know what kind it is yet. It's um, it's kind of like the the Loch Ness of Oaks Bottom. There's there's a turtle there somewhere, um, but we've not identified it yet. And so, um, it's very possible in the future that Oaks Bottom can become um, a more of a, a turtle safety space. Awesome, that's really cool. Thank you. All right, um, you're getting a lot of thanks. A lot of people loved the live turtles. I am definitely part of that crowd. That was really cool. Um, one of the questions that we actually had, had spoken about directly before hopping on that I'm glad came in through chat too, was um, asking how does the local turtle conservation status, you know, in and around Tryon and, and the Portland, Portland area, Pacific Northwest, how does that work fit into the larger picture of conservation of other species, such as like uh, leatherbacks, green sea turtles, etc. here on Turtle Island? And if sure. we can also touch on how Turtle Island tales and worldview um, inform your research, that would be really cool. So you got a two-parter question. All right, awesome. Yeah, so first thinking about turtles, um, you know, in general, as an ecologist, um, my job and kind of my passion is to improve the natural world for um, as much wildlife as possible. And sometimes it's best to do that by focusing on one species. And sometimes it's best to focus more on the entire system. And I think turtles are one place where it's best to work on the whole system. So thinking about the role that turtles play 
um, at a site. So what are they prey for? What are they eating? Um, how are they moving energy through the system? So we talked about turtles laying eggs, for example, up on land. So that's an example of where they're mostly feeding in the water, incorporating all of that energy into their body mass. And then they go up on land and lay eggs. And so they're transporting, actively transporting nutrients um, from the water back upland into the uplands. Um, and that's a really important function that they provide um, to keep our soils nice and, and healthy and nutritious. Um, and so really what we can do to keep turtles um, around and as healthy as possible is to keep everything else as healthy as possible. So that's where, even if you have a pond that doesn't necessarily have turtles, if you're thinking about how to keep it as healthy as possible for native vegetation, for um, native insects, for pollinators, for birds, for freshwater mussels, for mammals, all of that, um, that entire food web is gonna be stronger and more resilient toward anything that um, might disrupt um, and affect the animals that are there. And so by thinking kind of holistically about a site, you can really make a site as robust as possible and resilient um, to any effects of usually, you know, human disturbance or pollution or anything like that. Um, and in terms of, um, so there's this idea of Turtle Island and um, Turtle Island is part of a Native American belief. Um, and I am not Native American. I have a, a huge interest and uh, respect for um, Native traditional teachings. And part of what I would like, part of what I would like to do with my PhD is to de-Westernize some of the science. So there's a very Western way that science is done and it tends to exclude other ways of thought and knowing. And one of the things that I like to do is to, um, to try to relax some of the ways that, we're, that I do the science that I do so that it, there's room and there's space for other ways of knowing. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do is to, or well, that I'm doing is just trying to educate myself in general about different teachings of um, turtles and the place that they play in both the culture and the ecology of the Pacific Northwest but then also um, making sure that native tribes are involved and um, seen as authorities um, in consultation with some of the research that I'm doing. Um, so that's, that's also a, a pretty important piece of, of any research these days is to, to make sure that it's really more inclusive and that we're really honoring all different ways of knowing. That's really great, yeah, thank you. The Society for Ecological Restoration, I think I was looking at their broad sweeping framework and incorporating traditional ecological knowledge is absolutely like a part of what science, um, especially in Western institutions ought to be doing. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're sharing about how turtles transport nutrients from the like aquatic spaces. Upland is reminding me of, the, of, the, of how that's echoed with salmon where like a, yep. up to a third of the nitrogen in forests can be traced back through eDNA to salmon like yep. ocean nutrients making their way back up. So that's, it's really neat to think about how work that serves turtles or salmon or, you know, so many wildlife species really benefits the whole system. Yep, Thank you. Oh, this is, yeah, absolutely. This is a really, really cool conversation so far. Um, let's see, someone um, has had a red-eared slider turtle for 27 years and wants to know how she can get a permit for her. Awesome. Yeah. So it happens, right? It happens. A lot of times you just don't know. Um, and so, yes, uh, Susan Barnes at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, uh, can help you, can help walk you through that process. It's super simple, um, but it's something that you should definitely do. Um, part of what Fish and Wildlife likes to do is just know where those non-native turtles are so that they can kind of just keep track. And they'll check in with you every once in a while to make sure that you still have it and they can provide support if you don't want it anymore. Um, they can rehome it um, or, um, or you know, just help you find support if you're, if you're not wanting it anymore. So um, if you can't find Susan Barnes um, information, you can send me an email and I can, I can connect the two of you. But no shame, it happens. <laughs> Totally. Susan Barnes actually delivered our science talk on bats in like there fall of 2019. Yeah. Um, and so to answer the question that came through about the Watershed Council um, for volunteer events, I'm when I send out a follow up email here, I'll ask if folks want to be kept in the loop on our newsletter. Um, someone was asking about volunteering with the council. And so um, that is how I will get that information to you specifically. 
Um, someone was asking if any of the turtles in the area carry diseases like spelling or brucellosis. I don't think I pronounced either of those correctly. <laughs> Yeah, so um, in terms of diseases that harm them, that harmed other turtles, they can. So um, there are a couple of different um, diseases. So um, one is kind of like a pneumonia, a form of pneumonia that turtles can get. Um, so if you ever um, kind of get close to a turtle and hear it wheezing, that's probably what's happening. And you should definitely um, maybe call the Wildlife Care Center, the Audubon Wildlife Care Center or ODFW. Um, to see if they can um, come and treat it. But um, really the, the diseases that humans have to worry about is if you go and touch a turtle. Um, they can have salmonella, they can be, have E. coli, they can have a couple of different bacteria that aren't so good for our gut systems. So in general, if you were to find a turtle or touch a turtle, hold a turtle, make sure that you're washing your hands before and after. Um, and then there's also a, a disease um, called shell rot that's starting to, that for the last number of years has been affecting pond turtles in Washington especially. And there's some thought that it's connected to that head starting program that I was telling you all about where the turtles are raised um, through that kind of first most vulnerable stage of year of their life and then released. Um, some of those turtles are coming down with this fungal disease that actually eats away at the shell and it takes a lot to heal them from it. And so um, that's something that we're trying to learn more about. Um, it hasn't been seen in the Portland area. So it's not something that I've ever seen, ever witnessed. Um, it's not really a threat down here. Um, and it really seems to be pretty specific to pond turtles as well. I don't know that there have been many cases on painted turtles, um, but that's something else that's kind of out there and also threatening um, our native species. Um, and for the most part, these are all things that are naturally in the environment. Um, these are, you know, it's kind of like us getting the flu. It's something that's naturally there. And as long as the turtles are healthy, they can withstand it. It's when we start to have, um, you know, all of these different insults kind of one on top of each of another um, that they start to not be able to withstand even those somewhat simple diseases that historically they were able to withstand. So um, again, all advocation for <laughs> keeping our habitats as healthy as possible so that they can be resilient to things like disease. Thank you. Um, one other question about supporting native turtles, especially in this like matrix where we have non-native species. Um, can our turtles coexist with bullfrogs? What's that interaction like? Yeah, they can. So um, there's been a, a, an, a link that bullfrogs tend to prey on turtle hatchlings. So when turtle hatchlings are born, they're like the size of a quarter, they're tiny. And if you've ever seen some of the bullfrogs that we grow here in the Pacific Northwest, they are pretty big. Um, so bullfrogs can eat anything that will fit in their mouth. It's called gape limited. So literally their gape, the size of their gape limits what they can eat. So um, larger bullfrogs can definitely eat turtle hatchlings. There's some um, controversy around how often that happens though. So there are some sites where it's definitely, there've been um, bullfrog dissections and they found turtle hatchlings in the guts of bullfrogs, but there are also a lot of sites where they haven't found any evidence of predation by bullfrogs. So it seems to be a fairly site-by-site -site basis. And there's a lot of research right now trying to figure out what triggers bullfrogs to start preying on hatchlings so that we can better figure that out. But a lot of it is, yes, we know it can happen, but it doesn't always happen. And we're not sure exactly what the difference is, um, kind of what triggers it. Cool. Well, we're kind of looking on the specifics here with bullfrogs as a potential predator for the hatchlings. Um, this might've been just since I was multitasking and tracking things, but did we hear the specific, um, some specific predator animals and some specific like diet items of our native turtles? We did not. So mm -hmm. um, big predators um, really are skunks. So I had a, a friend of a friend of mine, uh, Jim Holly, did a really cool study up at Smith Bybee last summer while I was out there trapping, where he was coming out at night when the turtles were nesting, and he was following the nests um, kind of over time to see what was preying on the nests because we were finding that so few hatchlings um, actually survive to get into the water. And there were a couple of skunks, two or three skunks specifically, that just kind of <laughs> stash out at Smith and Bybee and every 
night, they come through and they sniff out and dig up and eat all of the turtle eggs that are laid that night. So skunks can be a really big issue, raccoons as well, um, and then coyotes for sure. So usually within the first couple days of a nest being laid, that's when it smells the most um, because that's where the female has um, you know, released her bladder. Um, and so it has a lot of the smell. And so that's really when it's most susceptible. But for the most part, we were finding upwards of 99% of the nests all being predated within 24 hours. And there's some really interesting research that looks at how the effect of, um, of human spaces is affecting that. So um, Smith and Bybee, for example, the nesting area is a super long linear space that makes it super easy for those predators to just walk a straight line right next to the pond and come across all of the nests. Whereas historically, if Marine Drive wasn't there, we would have a much larger nesting area. The nests would be a lot more spread out um, and it would be harder for the predators to pick off every single nest. So there are some kind of human caused or human induced effects that's kind of exacerbating the effect that predators can have on nests right now. Um, and in terms of what turtles eat, they're actually um, decomposers. So they like to eat dead stuff. So if a fish dies and falls to the bottom of the pond, that is like the best buffet ever. Um, I've been feeding my turtles worms for years and they love worms from my compost bin. They do eat some vegetation, um, but there's not um, a lot known about how much they're actually eating the vegetation itself and how much they're eating the bugs and happening to get the vegetation at the same time. So that's a, a little bit unknown, but they're mostly omnivorous. They're eating meat as well as some of the vegetation in the water. Cool, thank you. Um, you mentioned the um, Oregon Turtles website. Did that apply for both native turtles and non-native turtles? And is there anything that members of the public at large ought to do when we encounter non-native turtles? Yeah, so if you so if you encounter a non-native turtle and you know it's not a native turtle, if you feel safe, you can grab it and put it in a bucket and call myself or ODFW, Susan Barnes. Um, they will come and pick it up from you and they'll um, deal with it. If you have, for example, a snapping turtle, a few years ago, I had somebody call me frantically. They had a snapping turtle in their front yard. Um, and I told them, well, just keep an eye on it. I'll be there as soon as I can. And I had to drive across town and I got there and they had collected all of their neighbors and they were all sitting in lawn chairs in a circle around the snapping turtle, making sure it didn't go anywhere. So that's also an option. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, if you can at all corral it or put it in a bucket or under a recycling bin or something um, and keep it safe until somebody can come and remove it, that's really ideal. There's also a potential that maybe it's not a non-native, maybe it actually is a native turtle. So we don't wanna do anything too rash um, until that can be confirmed. Love that neighborhood teamwork. That's, <laughs> that's pretty fun to hear about. Yeah. Um, let's see. We had a question come through. Is anyone looking at boosting turtle habitats with turtle specific um, like restoration actions? Yeah. Um, it, like Lori mentioned that Paul Stamets is working um, on which mycelia help native and honeybees. So kind of helping boost the natives through something very specific. Is there any work on that in that range? <clears throat> Excuse me. So in terms of um, habitat restoration, really what you want is a pond that has a lot of different types of habitats. So you want a pond that has open water, but you also want emerging vegetation that kind of sticks up out of the water. You want floating vegetation because that's where all the insects and bugs like to hang out and that's where the turtles hunt. You want a shoreline that has enough vegetation that they can kind of safely move around to, you know, between the water and the uplands, but also has enough bare soil that they can easily move up to nest. And then within, you know, a few hundred feet or so of the pond, you want to make sure that you've got those areas for estivation and brumation. So those areas of either a dense forest or a thicket of some kind that they can kind of burrow into, hide from predators and escape the heat and the cold. So really the more um, kind of diverse the pond is, the more diverse the habitat is, the more likely it is to support turtles because the turtles need such a variety of different um, habitats. They can kind of pick and choose for themselves what they need and when during the year, and they can find it there. Um, and you know, the more robust a pond is too, the stronger the food web, the more food is gonna be there, the more turtles that will be able to be supported by that pond. 
love that habitat complexity. Um, cool. Let's see. Um, what are your thoughts on the future viability of Northwestern pond turtles in the Portland metro area? That's a great question. It's really interesting when you think about climate change, especially because, um, you know, as I mentioned, the Northwestern pond turtle tends to be found more commonly to the south of us. Um, is that going to change with global warming? Um, are we going to see an expansion of their range back into Portland in a more, um, uh, you know, kind of regular and, and consistent manner? Um, definitely a possibility. I think um, there are a lot of things about pond turtles that make them a little bit unique and different from painted turtles. And again, that's one of the things that I'm looking at um, with my PhD research. So. The reason that I chose this region is because it's the northern extent of the pond turtle and the southern extent of the range of the painted turtle. So this is kind of the one place in the world where they overlap um, and coexist in some places. And so one of the things that I'm doing is looking at a number of different habitat variables to try to understand if there are certain pieces of habitat that tend to drive occupancy. So um, in order to have turtles, do we have to have a certain square footage of nesting area? Do we have to have a pond that's a certain size and has a certain amount of open water? Do we need to have um, a, a, a maximum amount of pervious pavement, for example, um, within you know, a buffer around that pond? So what exactly are those specific um, you know, things that are, that are really driving whether turtles are able to exist or not, especially in the kind of urban to rural um, divide um, across Portland. Really neat. Thank you. I feel like that those kinds of findings would also help to kind of answer some of the previous questions that were coming through about what specifically for turtles can we do in addition to just having that complexity, but knowing those parameters would be really interesting. And that's really one of the reasons I waited to do my PhD because I've been doing turtle research for a number of years now and I wanted to do something that was gonna be important and that was very management focused. So mm -hmm. that's the information that I need to do my job at Parks well. And so that's the information that I seek because I know that that's gonna be really helpful for us to right now on the ground conserve turtles in our area. So Great. that's the goal. Cool. Um, let's see, someone lives along Crystal, so we're going from Tryon over to Johnson Creek. Yes. Um, so someone lives along Crystal Springs Creek, which is a tributary to Johnson Creek, um, just after it passes under McLaughlin Boulevard, which is a pretty urban impacted space. Um, and they were wondering if, could there be any turtle species in their area to watch for? There are. So um, painted turtles are not uncommon. So. Um, painted turtles historically would have been fairly common throughout that Crystal Springs area, especially um, through the Westmoreland Park area, um, where it turned into a little bit more floodplain. Right now, there are a couple of red eared sliders, a couple of non native turtles that I've been trying to trap out for a couple of years, but they're very savvy. Um, <laughs> they, they see me coming and they know what's up. Um, so, yes, there are turtles um, in Reed Canyon as well as down through Crystal Springs and into kind of the Westmoreland Park area. Historically, they would have been more native, um, but right now it seems to be. Um, almost entirely the non-native red-eared slider. So I'm hoping that if I can trap out those sliders, it'll make more space and it will encourage the painted turtles, the natives to come back up and re-inhabit that spot. Neat. Um, let's see, we had a really neat question come through. So folks, um, we're going on 1.15 here. We have time to stretch for a little bit longer. We might be winding down in Q&A. So if you have any, please do send them in on chat. Um, someone asked if um, you've been able to monitor sites where beavers are reestablishing floodplain connectivity and the potential impacts that their presence would have on turtle abundance. Absolutely. I don't know of any specific research. There's a lot of research looking at the effect of beavers um, and the habitats that they create on you know, kind of a diversity of different wildlife. I've looked at it specifically at Oaks Bottom when it comes to red-legged frogs, for example. So that culvert um, replacement project that we did in 2019, um, we have several very active beaver that have created some really amazing ponds. And we've got red-legged frogs breeding in those little ponded areas for the first time um, over the last couple of years. So um, I don't know of any spe turtle specific research um, with beavers, especially in the Pacific Northwest, but it's definitely something that we know about and that we know is, is happening. Thank you. 
Um, people asked, we mentioned earlier with the Watershed Council volunteer opportunities, are there any other maybe more hands-on turtley volunteer opportunities for people? There are. Um, so I do um, quite a bit of trapping um, for Portland Parks and Rec, as well as for my PhD project outside of um, parks and natural areas. Um, I definitely can use some volunteers. Um, it's hard to have too many because we're really, you know, we're trapping turtles, we're going around and um, measuring and weighing and, and, and that sort of thing. And you can only have a certain number of people, you know, kind of involved at one time. Really the best wit thing that you can do is to get out and report turtles that you've seen. So especially if you think you know of a pond that nobody else has surveyed before, go check it out and put it up on iNaturalist. Every year I go through iNaturalist for new sightings and new information. And I do that both for my parks job um, on natural areas as well as for my PhD project. So um, those crowdsourcing services are really, really helpful to, to scientists. So being able to, to capture that information that way is really helpful. That's really cool to know, thank you. Um, all right, would these native turtles be considered terrapins? That question came through on our Facebook. That is an excellent question. I saw that question come through and I was going to look up what the technical word terrapin actually is. Um, I think terrapin is uh, just a much more general word for um, uh, turtles. So yeah, it's kind of like, you know, dirt, for example, isn't a scientific word. It's kind of whatever you just don't want to be on your floor is dirt. Um, so uh, terrapin is one of those um, those words. Sometimes it's the actual formal common name, like diamondback terrapin, for example. Um, but a lot of it is more just a cultural term that folks will use. So turtles, tortoises, um, uh, and terrapins are kind of used interchangeably for the most part. Tortoises are really the, the non-aquatic, the, um, the deserts, the more burrowing uh, species. Turtles is kind of a more umbrella term. And then terrapin, I feel like is more of a, a cultural term that's used more commonly in kind of the Southeastern part of the US. We don't really use it as much um, in the Midwest or, or out here out West. That tracks with what I saw because I was curious and I Googled that one myself <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> All right, cool. So. Um, I don't have any other questions I don't think to share um, other than, so the only other thing I do have to share is to thank everybody for joining us again today. Um, it was really neat, Laura, to get a sense for um, for the shape of kind of turtles in the whole area and then also how that tracks specifically with the Tryon Creek Watershed Council um, or with the watershed and then the council's work since that's where I work. Um, and so it's neat because we've seen emerging science on like the, the habitat quality for fish in the watershed. Mm -hmm. And so Tryon Creek is, you know, a cool water tributary to the Willamette River for migrating salmonids. And uh, like, like, you know, you mentioned Susan Barnes and we've heard from her on bats and we've heard about native bees and all sorts of um, wildlife. And so this was just fun to add another one to the docket. Um, I will um, upload this recording to YouTube later on today and send out a link to everybody that um, signed up. So you guys will be able to access this talk again and continue learning. And we do have recordings of our previous science talks online too. Uh, and I, I think that's just about it. I'm not seeing any last minute questions come through for you, Laura. So we might be ready to wrap up. Great. Well, any any other final plugs? Questions. I would just say Alexis has my contact information. So if anybody has any specific questions or um, like that person with the red-eared slider, I'm happy to help you out. Awesome. That's great. Thank you guys so much. Seeing nothing else come through other than thank yous, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording and uh, stop the Zoom meeting. Thank you guys so, so much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>